Thank you for lovely music. I love that song, and what a great thought. The battle belongs to you. And I know we had some verses in our lesson this week that talked about not relying on ourselves, but relying on God. And I hope um, you all had a great Easter, um, and you can still think Christ is risen indeed, especially when the sun's shining, right? So this week, we had to read what seemed like a paperback novel's worth of names and places. And just to let you know, in your small group this week, there will be a test for the correct pronunciation. As my daughter would say, ha ha. Well, here is a map. It's the best map I could see online. Um, I'm sure you're like me and you're tired of like squinting and looking in the back of your Bible at all the tiny maps. But I thought this one was quite good because it says, according to the book of Joshua. So you can see that Philistia is still not occupied. And I'm not sure of my facts, but I have a feeling it took... King David to finally conquer the Philistines. So the land was pre-divided by a sacred lottery. And I found a few references in Numbers where God tells Moses how the land of Canaan is to be divided by lot. In Numbers 33, 54, when God tells Moses to distribute the land by lot according to your clans, to the larger group, give a larger inheritance, smaller group, a smaller inheritance, where whatever falls to them by lot will be theirs. The casting of lots was the only sanctioned means of divination, and it was to be performed before a high priest, so it wasn't really gambling, you know, as we think of, ooh, division, who takes the short straw? This was how they did it, and I believe that it was done this way before the high priest until um, the New Testament. So um, Judah was drawn first, and his territory rivaled only by East Manasseh. The lottery was for nine and a half tribes, if you remember, because... Uh, Moses had already promised to the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh, land east of the Jordan, which you can see there, it's quite a big chunk of land, because they thought it was good for raising cattle. The fact that these tribes would not be living within God's appointed land didn't seem to worry them, but I think it's going to worry them later on. It's in Numbers 13 going back to Numbers, that we hear the name of Caleb for the first time as God's ordained leader of the tribe of Judah. Now, I know that this is in our study guide, but I want to talk about Genesis. Back in Genesis 49, um, as Jacob blesses his sons before he dies, in verses 8 and 9 of that chapter we read, Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Remember last week it was their feet were on the neck of the enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, O Judah. You return from the prey, my son, like a lion. He crouches and lies down like a lioness who dares to rouse him. And in Revelation 5.5, 5, we read that when they were... Um, deciding who was worthy to break the seals and open the scroll, um, one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And of course, that's talking about Jesus. In Matthew's line of genealogy, in his first chapter of the book of Matthew, we see the character of Judah he is in verse 3, and he was the great, great, great grandfather of Salmon, who married Rahab and gave birth to Boaz, who married Ruth in the book of Ruth. Um, and they gave birth to Obed, and Obed was the grandfather of King David. And so it goes on until we reach verse 16, which tells us, Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is the Christ. 
the Lion of Judah. So, going back to our story, where we are seeing the tribes get settled in the land promised to them by God, the first allocation goes to the tribe of Judah. So, let's read Joshua 14, 6 through 14. Now, the men of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, you know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my brothers who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt with fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance. And actually, if you find a map um, which shows the route the spies took from Numbers, it goes right up the middle of Canaan. So he's saying, the land your feet have uh, walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since that time he said this to Moses while Israel moved around in the desert. So here I am today, 85 years old. I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. You know, when I'm 85 years old, this, I, w I won't be saying the same thing. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified, but the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. Then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. So Hebron has belonged to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, ever since, because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. And then chapter 15 goes on to explain the rest of the allocation for the tribe of Judah. So going back again to Numbers 13, when the Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the Israelites from each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. Then we find out that of these 12 men came Caleb, son of Jephunneh, from the tribe of Judah, and Hoshea, a.k.a. Joshua, son of Nun, and he was from the Ephraim tribe. Since Caleb belonged to the tribe of Judah, and if you remember, this tribe got first place in the lottery, and also he personally had been one of the two faithful spies exploring the land of Canaan, um, and had returned and stood before Moses, saying in Numbers 13, 30, let's all go at once to the land. We can certainly conquer it. Well, he received his inheritance first. Um, he got first dibs. Um, right before Judah got theirs. Caleb got his choice. Um, he reminded um, Joshua that uh, Moses had promised him 45 years before that they would survive the years of wandering, the only two to do so, and they would receive inheritance in the land. And I think this promise must have given them great joy and courage I mean, they had to endure all those years of wandering and waiting, so much waiting. Caleb made his request, give me this hill country. He did so knowing the risks that the Anakites were there in their great fortified cities. And his plea was without arrogance, but with a faith that the Lord would be with him and drive them out. So Caleb didn't ask for the most bountiful land, the most arable farming land. He asked for hill country. So I found this slide um, called, give me this mountain. I thought that was quite neat. And um, it's also a, an inspirational Christian book called Give Me This Mountain by a pastor called Joseph Prince. And I'm sure Caleb had no idea that um, what an impact 
his decision would and his actions would have in the future and what a role model he would become. So let's look at this man, Caleb. And I think of him as a pilgrim, if ever there was one. So I Googled the definition of pilgrim on my phone, on my trusty phone, and it said, a person who journeys to a sacred place for religious reasons. So if we were to read A Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan, we would know that a pilgrimage is a lifelong journey requiring courage, fortitude, and great faith. Caleb was 85 years old, but he did not look for an easy task suited to an old man. He didn't look for the easy chair with his cup of tea at three o'clock. He asked Joshua for mountains to climb and giants to conquer. His strength was in the Lord, and he knew that God wouldn't fail him. The secret of Caleb's life is found in a phrase that's repeated many times in Scripture. He wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. In Numbers 14.24, God says about Caleb that he had remained loyal to God. In... Um, so we know that Caleb was an overcomer on his pilgrimage because he had an undying and unwavering faith in the Lord. In Joshua 15, we see also Caleb providing for his next generation. So in Joshua, let's read Joshua 15, 13 through 19, which says, in accordance with the Lord's command to him, Joshua gave to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, a portion of Judah. Kiriath Arba, that is, oh, that is Hebron. Arba was the forefather of Anak. So you remember that, that this land was overrun with the Anakites. Um, so from Hebron, Caleb drove out the three Anakites, Sheshe, Ahiman, and Talme, descendants of Anak. From there, he marched against the people living in Debir, formerly Kiriath Sefer, and Caleb said, I will give my daughter Aksa in marriage to the man who attacks and captures Kiriath Sephir. Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's brother, took it, so Caleb gave his daughter Aksa to him in marriage. One day, when she came to Othniel, she urged him to ask her father for a field. When she got off her donkey, Caleb asked her, What can I do for you? She replied, do me a special favor, since you have given me the land in the Negev, give me also springs of water. So Caleb gave her the upper and lower springs. Just to let you know that all the pronunciations there were the English pronunciations. Some of Caleb's daring faith had rubbed off on his son-in-law, Othniel, who later became a God-ordained judge. See the next book of the Bible, the book of Judges. And Caleb's faith also touched his daughter, for she had the faith to ask him not only for a field, but water to irrigate the land. Caleb's example of faith was, in fact, more valuable to his family than the property he claimed for them. So, if my facts are correct, Caleb was born into slavery in Egypt and was in his late 30s when he crossed the Red Sea. At Kadesh Barnea, he was 40 years old when sent to spy on Canaan, and he's finally been given his home in the promised land of Canaan at 85. His occupations were slave, scout, soldier, shepherd, and overall pilgrim. After being a slave for over 30 years, he must have been so thrilled when Moses took everybody out. I mean, imagine being in the prime of life when God breathes on the sea and parts the Red Sea and you're marching through it and you have such faith and courage and vigor to, to follow this man Moses because he's a man of God to the promised land. And he was not discouraged when the people of Israel had to wander around for another 40 years. He was a patient, loyal, true follower of God. His voice was the minority after the fateful spying expedition, and he never failed to express faith in God's promises in spite of apparent obstacles. 
Caleb was just a man. But he was a man with faith in a great and awesome God, at a time and a place where faith was dwindling. So, how do we fit into this story? How, what does it mean to us? So this is an illustration from a copy of the book, Pilgrim's Progress. So this is Christian. He's got all these worldly goods plus his frying pan on his back. He's got his Bible and his walking stick. So here's a picture of my husband, Jim, and I on a two-day backpacking adventure in the Rocky Mountain Na National Park. So you see, we have all our worldly goods on our backs. We've got our walking sticks. We're on foot. So do you think this makes us pilgrims? Um, actually, I'm not sure about that. We were smiling. And there's two of us, and I know for a fact that we were not carrying all our worldly goods on our back, even though it did feel like that. And we were heading downhill to the car where we were staying in a cabin to get a hot shower and go out for dinner, and then we're driving home, so no. So, <laughs> it made me think about this. So I don't think a pilgrimage involves what you look like or where you are for that matter. But I do think it involves us personally. So even if we have the most loving family, the closest relationship with our spouse or a good friend, I believe that your pilgrimage involves you and mine involves me and our relationship with our Heavenly Father possible through the work of Jesus Christ. So looking back at our original definition, a person who journeys to a sacred place for religious reasons, D. Dias, who is the director of the Centra, Center of Pilgrimage Studies at the University of York in England said, because of Hebrews 13, 14, which says, for this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to a home yet to come. And 1 Peter 2.11, which says, Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. And lastly, Philippians 3.20, we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. And I'm sure there's more verses she says Christians are therefore encouraged to see themselves as pilgrims and strangers on earth whose home is in heaven. The Christian life itself is thus seen as a journey toward that homeland in which the individual believer seeks to follow and obey Christ through an alien and frequently hostile world. Figures such as Abraham are presented as examples of faithful servants and pilgrims to be imitated. So from this, we, are, as, we as Christians are encouraged to see ourselves as pilgrims and strangers on the earth, temporary residents whose home is in heaven. I have a home in the Grange Park, and I love my home. My home is kind of old and got peeling paint in places, but it's safe and it's cozy, and since we got a new roof, it doesn't leak. So what does that look like for me today? Does this world really seem like an alien, hostile place to us? I love my neighborhood. I can go for a walk. I mean, there's a, sometimes there's a couple of crazy-looking guys coming out of the woods, but it's pretty safe. It's a lovely area. But, you know, maybe it's not quite this extreme. We're not being persecuted as such. But sometimes we feel a bit left out. I mean, have you ever been to a party where somebody tells a joke and you don't understand it or you find it offensive? I work in the library and um, quite a few years ago, a book came out. I won't say the title in case somebody's read it. But it was the first book when I 
since I've been working at the library that had over 300 holes on it. It was checked out by old ladies, teenagers, men, and I thought, what on earth? I must read this book. I tried three times to get into this book, and I hated this book. It was ugly. It was offensive. I didn't find anything in this book that I liked. So I was, I felt I was on the outside of this group of people like, oh, you have to read this book. It's fantastic. In my old book club that I was in many years ago, they called me the religious expert. I have been called church lady at work. I have work, walked in the back office and everyone was sort of shut up. So I don't know what they were talking about. So yes, you don't quite fit in. I think, who else do you know goes to a women's Bible study on a Thursday morning? Who reads the Bible? I mean, sometimes you can't even talk to your close friends about this because they don't do what you do. They don't, they don't understand what you have. Your family doesn't. I used to go home and see my family in England, and I would pray and pray, and I could not have, my dad used to say to me in the early days, oh, Christmas, that's just for children. We could never talk about it personally. So I felt that I was different. I was a bit of a stranger in the land. Now, Jesus says in Matthew 7.13, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. And I still find it really hard to accept that of the two million people that originally crossed the Red Sea and saw the miracles of God, only two of those original people, Caleb and Joshua, made it to the Promised Land. They were the only two on the narrow road. So we are on our pilgrimage and we have taken up the cross of Christ, so to speak, and we're following him. We might not be fighting giants, even though in our lives it might seem that way as we face big health problems or financial difficulties. Our journeys might seem easy sometimes, but other times they are fraught with discouragement. And we know that Satan is there. He's prowling around with his minions, putting thoughts in our head, discouraging thoughts, fearful thoughts. And sometimes we don't seem to have the strength to stop that, to remember who wins the ultimate battle. So it is a fight. And we have to remember that we have a map, that we have a guide. The guide who loves us and who died for us. And we have a destination that might cost us, well, it's going to cost us our earthly life, whether it's, I don't know how many years down the road, or it might be today. And as Paul said, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Whether you're living for Christ now or you die and you're with Christ. And along the way, we come to Bible study, we come to church, we sing praises to God. In the quiet times of home, at home we pray and we read his word and we think about God and we think about Jesus and we are invigorated, revitalized, energized, emboldened, uplifted and given hope to continue our journey down the narrow road to our promised land. Caleb's promised land was Hebron, his mountain in the land God had promised him. Our promised land is the kingdom of heaven, 
a place that's full of every good and perfect thing. And it's full of light because Jesus lives there and he is light. When I was young, my mother took me to church and I loved the old hymns. And we would sing a hymn that was adapted from the second part of Pilgrim's Progress. And it was called to be a pilgrim or he who would valiant be. And these are the words. He who would valiant be, against all disaster, let him in constancy follow the master. There's no discouragement shall make him once relent his first avowed intent to be a pilgrim. Whoso beset him round with dismal stories, do but themselves confound. His strength the more is. No foe shall stay his might. Though he with giants fight, he will make good his right to be a pilgrim. Since, Lord, thou dost defend us with thy spirit, we know we at the end shall life inherit. Then fancies flee away, I'll care not what men say, I'll labor night and day to be a pilgrim. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, help us to keep our eyes on heaven through you, Jesus. Our thoughts on you, dear Father, help us to know this is not our home. Help us to live as though this is temporary and give us the patience as we go through the wilderness. Help us to know we have the Lion of Judah on our side who died for us and who loves us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.